Good morning, I'm Jessica Lovell and welcome back to the Morning Medical Update. Cervical cancer used to be a leading cause of cancer deaths for women in the United States. Thankfully though, screening and prevention made progress in saving lives. Today we're gonna hear how one woman was able to catch her cancer early before it spread. And we'll remind you of the critical importance of the HPV vaccine. Plus, we'll get an update on respiratory viruses from Dr. Dana Hawkinson. But first, let's get to our morning rounds today. Winter typically leads to a drop in blood donors, and while blood supplies may drop, of course, the demand is still here. We are joined this morning by Chelsea Smith with the Community Blood Center. Chelsea, good morning. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. We're meeting like this again because there is a need. So let's talk about that. What does the blood supply look like now? Yeah, so unfortunately, we're still in a state of shortage. Technically, that means we're under the ideal five to seven day inventory. So we've been here essentially since the onset of the pandemic with um, donations, you know, kind of roller coastering over the last three years. But unfortunately, we haven't leveled out. So we are sitting at about a one day supply of O neg and O positive right now. Um, additionally, B negative is about a two, two, days, two day supply, I'm sorry and then a, a critical shortage of platelets as well. But you always need all blood types, we know. We mentioned the, the winter time and, and this, this season of the year, but anything else that contributes to a drop in the donations right now? Yeah, so January is National Blood Donor Month actually for um, a, a very strategic reason. About 50 years ago, President Richard Nixon uh, signed into um, effect January being National Blood Donor Month in the United States because of the winter uh, challenges that we experience. So it's not just you know the winter weather that keeps people away. We're about to experience some weather that we think is definitely going to impact our blood supply in a negative way. Um, but also the holiday season is just difficult for blood collection. People are traveling. Uh, schools are on break. Um, also, seasonal, seasonal illnesses keep people away. Uh, so it's a host of things that happen during the winter months that create essentially a blood shortage and, and oftentimes a blood emergency. Yeah, so all hands on deck. There's ways that we can help. Uh, scheduling a blood donation is actually very easy. You can learn more about that at savealife.org uh, to go there to find out where you could donate. And we know donations dropped during the pandemic, as, as you mentioned earlier. Um, tell us a little bit about what that has looked like. You said you've never really been able to get solid footing when it comes to that since, since the, the, the pandemic, but what's it look like and, and where do you hope it'll go? Yeah, so as I mentioned, it's essentially been a sustained shortage since the onset of the pandemic. Um, and, and simply put, I, the pandemic kind of shook the foundation on which we collected blood. A lot of um, our blood in this community came from uh, workplace blood drives, school blood drives, uh, places we haven't been able to go back into because now a lot of places are working remotely. Um, schools aren't collecting quite as much as they used to collect. We missed um, like three years of school blood donations, meaning that all of those kids that would have donated blood for the very first time at their school blood drive, we missed out on getting to introduce that to them. So unfortunately, what we're seeing now is that blood donation isn't as routine a habit for a lot of people as it used to be. Um, so this year, we're actually specifically challenging our community members to donate once per season. Um, it's, it's a known statistic in our country that about 60% of the population can donate and only 3% do. We're asking for you know just one more percent we're asking people to come in, donate that four, that four times per year or once per season um, and make it a habit again so that we can get out of this essentially chronic blood shortage. And just quickly before, before we let you go, just remind people just how quick and easy it can be to, to walk in. Yeah, so from beginning to end when you're donating blood, it takes maybe 45 minutes to an hour. Um, right now, I was just down in our donor center. We don't have anybody there, so it'll take you maybe 30 minutes. You get registered um, you, with a photo ID. You'll go through a medical history process. We'll test your iron levels, your blood pressure, your, your temperature, things like that. And then you're donating blood and having snacks. So it takes, um, uh, it's a very quick process. And then uh, right now, because our blood supply is so low, your unit it, your um, your donation could actually be in a patient's arm within 24 hours. All right, walk in, donate blood, have snacks. Sounds pretty easy. Chelsea, mm -hmm. always good yeah. to see you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me.
Well, almost all cases of cervical cancer are caused by the human papilloma virus, or otherwise known as HPV. And now that we have a vaccine for HPV, there is hope of effectively eliminating cervical cancer in the next century. But until that day, women and their doctors they just simply need to be vigilant and on the lookout. Joining us today is Dr. Andrea Jewell, the Division Director of Gynecologic Oncology at the University of Kansas Cancer Center, as well as a cervical cancer survivor. Joining us today, Brooke Inslee. Uh, Brooke, good to have you here with us. Good Dr. morning. Dr. Jewell, always good to have you. Thank you. So Brooke, just take us back to the summer of 2022, 29 years old young. You told us uh, you went into your gynecologist, you were going in to replace an IUD, is that correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Your birth control. Um, you were there. You also had a pap smear that came back abnormal. Mm -hmm. um, so talk to us what happened from, from that moment on and what you were learning. Yeah, so I had my son in 2016. Um, so I had my IUD up until it was time to have it changed out, which I had gone in for. Um, and I was right on that time that it was the recommended time to have it taken out. Um, so I went in, she took it out, replaced it. Um, she went ahead and did a pap. And that was kind of the start of all of it. She said that everything from the naked eye looked great. Um, and so leaving the office that day, I had no idea what was about to happen. So you get a phone call? Yep, I got a phone call. Tell us about it. Not long after, um, I think it was a few days, mm -hmm. she called me and she was like, hey, um, you're pap smear came back abnormal, which I had never had before. I'd never had an abnormal pap. And so that from the start was a little eerie. Um, she said, no big deal, this happens. Mm -hmm. um, we wanna just do a few more things. And then that's when she scheduled me to go into the ultrasound to kind of see what was going on. So Dr. Jewel, yeah, mm -hmm. an abnormal pap, that doesn't always mean cancer. These, these happen, right? It doesn't. So the overwhelming majority of the time an abnormal pap smear does not mean that a person has cancer. Normally it's, either just atypical cells that we follow up on. Sometimes it's precancerous cells that we can remove and we just follow. Um, she definitely falls in the outlier of someone who'd never had an abnormal pap, um, was getting follow up, um, but just a good example of why you need to be following up because there are sometimes, typically cervical cancer is very slow growing and that's why we can catch it so early with pap smears. Um, her cancer was obviously growing a little more quickly, but because she was getting close follow-up, we still were able to catch it early. It is, so cervical cancer is pretty slow growing normally. It is typically. typically okay, yeah. so then when you get, um, you get this pap smear, you hear about the abnormal pap and then before we get to Dr. Jewell, what kind of testing were they doing for you? Were you did you have a colonoscopy? Yeah. Were, was there ultrasound? Yeah. So so um, they brought me in, I had an ultrasound, and in that same day, I came in early for the ultrasound, and then an hour later had the colposcopy. Got it, got so. it. Okay, so, and is this all pretty typical? Mm -hmm. Now tell us, tell us a little bit more about a coloscopy. People have never heard of that. Yeah, so a, a colposcopy is where you use a microscope to take a closer look at the cervix so mm -hmm. you can take directed biopsies. Um, so sometimes what I might not see with my naked eye, if I have a microscope and put special medicine on the cervix, I may actually see abnormal cells there so I can do targeted biopsies. So what do you remember about that call from, from Dr. Jewell? Um, so after I had my colposcopy, my um, my regular doctor was actually the first call I got and she told me, you know, there are a lot of precancer cells. This now, we need to get you to an oncologist to see exactly what's going on. So that was when I was handed over to Dr. Jewell. These are all words you just don't expect to see. Yeah. Cancer, precancerous, on, go, yeah. going to see an, an oncologist. You're yeah. 29 years old. You celebrated yeah. your 30th birthday throughout yeah. all of this, right? Yeah. Tell yeah. us a little bit about that yeah. and, and, and just kind of how you were tackling this time of your life. Yeah, yeah, my boyfriend at the time, who's now my fiance, um, was so sweet and he planned a small surprise party at a local winery and it was just a good time to hang out with all my friends and kind of take my mind off of everything that was going on because it literally was right in the middle of everything. No fun. No. So, <laughs> so Dr. Jewel, what do you remember about this um, meeting, Brooke? Was there anything that stuck out with, to you about her particular diagnosis? Yeah, Tell us well, about. you know, it's not, surprising that her doctor, her initial doctor, didn't see anything on exam. So your cervix, when you think about your cervix, it's the opening to your uterus. They're not like two distinct organs, your uterus and cervix. Even though we talk about them separately, they're really like one organ and the cervix is the opening to the uterus. And so a lot of times when someone has a cervical cancer and I go in and do an exam, I can see the cancer because it's on the face or the opening and so you can see it growing. 
Brooke had a cancer that was actually up inside the cervix. So the front, the opening to her cervix actually looked totally normal. This cancer was growing up and so she's absolutely someone that if she wasn't getting pap smears, um, we would not have caught this cancer until much later because it was up higher and growing down, which some, some of the cancers are that way. We call them endocervical cancers. Um, and so I remember seeing her doing the exam saying, well, the biopsies show this. We need to get a bigger biopsy so we can see the size of the cancer because that's going to dictate what type of treatments we can talk about. We'll get to that in one second. What kind of symptoms were you having? Anything? Um, leading up to, actually, it's interesting because back in 2017, I had an episode where I was just in a lot of pain. I ended up going to the ER and they just, I had a, a cyst on my ovary that they thought had burst and that was causing my pain. Um, so anytime I had pain similar to that, that's just kind of what I would chalk it up to was I have ovarian cysts. So that's that's what's causing my pain and I would, you know, take medicine for it and I'd move on. Um, some other things, light bleeding after intercourse, um, at times pain with intercourse, nothing extreme. I wasn't having extreme you know, symptoms by any means. And that's tough because you're attributing it to some other issue you might be having mm -hmm. and you kind of, kind of blow it off and don't yeah. think much of it. You said something that was interesting though, that you said you weren't surprised that her doctor didn't see it at first. Yeah. So that's again why those, why the screening and the pap smear yeah. is so important because without that, we would she have would never not be, diagnosed You two her. would not be mm -mm. sitting here together Correct. today. Yeah. So let's talk about the treatment plan. How yeah. did you know what route to take? Um, so when I meet patients coming to me with a new diagnosis of cervical cancer, I talk about there are sort of two standard treatments. Um, and so for early stage cancers, we always want to consider surgery as one of the treatments. Uh, your cervix is close to a lot of important organs. So your bladder lays on top of your uterus and cervix, which lay on top of your rectum. And so for us to be able to do a safe and effective, what we call curative surgery, we have to be able to get wide margins around that. So you can imagine if you have these really important structures that are so close, if you have a certain size of cancer, I'm not gonna be able to dissect out wide enough. Um, and so that's really the important thing that tells us, like the size of the cancer is what tells us what the best treatment is. If I don't think I can effectively do surgery or curative surgery, we then do a combination of chemotherapy and radiation. They're both equally effective, so they can both be equally curative. It really just depends on the size and location of the cancer. And so that's why it's really important that you see an oncologist to get the right imaging, to get the right exams, because that will help dictate what your right next steps in treatment are. And does, did her age become a factor in her treatment plan? Well, age, age is always a factor, and healthcare is now a lot better about considering fertility sparing treatments where 30, 40 years ago that wasn't something that people talked about. Um, and so that was certainly something we had a conversation about of you're really young, you know, what are your what are your thoughts on having more kids? What are your thoughts on fertility? Um, and so that was certainly a component of our conversation. There are some surgical fertility sparing options that can sometimes save the uterus, meaning we just remove the cervix and the tissue around it, and so women can still have a uterus. Um, the location and size of her cancer was not gonna make sparing her uterus a possibility. That being said though, we spare ovaries, and so some women go on to meet with the IVF doctors and they do ovarian stimulation and get embryos. They have to have a surrogate, but they're still able to have biologically their, their own children. So those are all conversations that are overwhelming, but we have when you're coming in, we're like, all right, listen, let's put this all out there. You know, what are our thoughts? You're 29 now, but five years from now, you know, what are our thoughts gonna be with this? And so we had a lot of those conversations in the upfront. What do you remember from those conversations and what was it like to hear that you're gonna to have to have the hysterectomy? Yeah, so honestly, um, that was something that, you know, I was already in a relationship. That's mm -hmm. something that we had already talked about long before this diagnosis came along, um, that I have, I have my son now. Um, so we already have one child. So if there was a possibility that I wasn't gonna be able to have any more children, um, we were okay with it. We did still go ahead and meet with fertility doctors and talk about, you know, IVF and all of that because I do still have my ovaries. So. so, and then you told us you were terrified before your surgery. Yes. So you specifically wanted to mention that. Tell us what was <laughs> going on. How did you figure out your way through that? Yeah, so it was just really, um, it was scary because you know, I, I've had, I had my gallbladder removed before. That's laparoscopic. I just kind of put it in the same category. Unfortunately, this was not the same type of surgery. Um, so my incision is about a foot 
in a foot long. Um, it goes from my pant line to about four inches above my belly button. Um, and there was, you know, they said there was a possibility I could wake up with tubes, or not tubes, um, drains. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, there was, I was gonna have to have a catheter for two weeks. And so just all of these things, and it's a major surgery, so you just have all of these things going through your head. And it can be, it can be overwhelming, but Doctors were great, nurses were great. Everybody was so good at making me feel so comfortable. But you did have a complication, is that what I understand? Yeah. Put you back in the hospital? Yep. What happened? Yep. Um, about three weeks after my surgery, I noticed that I didn't really have great control of my bladder. Um, I just, you know, it was, it was nothing extreme. I wasn't full on, you know, losing complete control of my bladder. There was just some leakage, um, it, but it wasn't, like I said, extreme. So that lasted for about a day and a half, and then I was just in excruciating pain. Um, we called an ambulance, I went to the hospital, and they said that my abdomen was full of urine, and there was a possibility of going septic. Rare, common? So about a third of patients who have radical hysterectomies have significant urinary bladder, ureter complications afterwards. Hers was on more of the extreme end. Mm -hmm. um, so she had a fistula is what we call it. And so essentially because we're operating so close to the tubes that connect your kidneys to your bladder, there's potential that if that tissue gets thinned out, they can like open up and cause a fistula, which is what she had and, and leak urine into the abdomen. Um, most of the time people have urinary retention, sort of things like that after the surgery. She had a bigger complication, but we were able to fix it without another major surgery um, and, and it all worked out. But up to a third of patients after radical hysterectomy can have significant complications. And where does Brooke stand today? Health-wise and uh, future she treatment? Can Cancer-free, no. no. She just had to have a hernia repair operation <laughs> for, her, for her incision, but she is cancer-free and engaged. I know, so. Yeah. So let's talk about them. Let's, talk, let's get to the good stuff. Let's yeah. talk about the men in your life. Yeah, uh, yeah. And tell us, tell us oh. a little bit about these guys. They're so great. Um, my fiance, Brandon, yep, we um, got engaged right after Thanksgiving. Um, it was so sweet, it was, you know, just the just the three of us, very intimate. I it was perfect. Um, I have a seven year old named Chase. He's he's amazing. He's such a great kid, and he was a trooper through all of this. I bet. I um, bet. He was so great. So that's what very, you fight for, right blessed. there, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's what that's what makes it happen. So you also got to take uh, part in the crucial catch. Yeah. So uh, tell fun. all about we know promoting screening and cancer screening. Um, ladies, both of you, just tell us a little bit about what that experience was like for you. Yeah. It was unreal. Being out on the field and just seeing all those people, it, it's 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 undescribable. Coach Reed, it is such a cool yeah. experience. Yeah, we did get to meet Coach Reed. That was awesome. <laughs> Up on the big screen. Oh, yep, we yep. were <laughs> Casey Wolf. Yeah. We were very busy during the game. You know, we got to do the luncheon. It was it was just such a cool experience. Yeah. It was amazing. Dr. Joel, what's it like though to be able to bring? one of your patients along for an event like this? It's, it was so wonderful for so many, I like, I, cause Brooke was in the hospital. So like, I, I know Brooke's dad, I know her fiance, <laughs> like, you know, I know these people and I've met them a bunch, but it was just a really nice icing on a, just we'd gone through this whole journey together and it was yeah. not easy and it was not perfect. But here's like a really fun, positive thing that we could do together to yeah. celebrate kicking this cancer's butt and, enjoying the Chiefs and having a good time. Yeah. So it was yeah. really nice. So let's talk about the importance of screening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can we talk a little bit about that and then yeah. also about the vaccine, the HPV yeah, vaccine? Yeah, absolutely. So um, women should start getting pap smears at the age of 21. Mm -hmm. um, and they'll talk a lot about um, pap only or co-testing. And so really what you want to know is co-testing means you're sending an HPV test along with looking at the cells underneath the microscope. So a pap is a really good screening test, meaning that it's really good at picking up abnormal cells, but it's not perfect, meaning like it's not, it'll pick, it'll have a lot of false positives. That's like a, a right way to think about it, but that's good because it means you're getting further screening, you're getting extra tests. Um, so absolutely, you know, they've updated the guidelines that women with normal pap smears every three to five years, um, depending on what your previous tests were. Um, so you should always be going in. I, I'm an oncologist, so I say every woman every year should be getting a pelvic exam. So like a perfect example is you were having pain, you were having other stuff, 
if you go in and you're having those symptoms and someone doesn't do a pelvic exam, you need to go to a gynecologist. Someone needs to be assessing the size of your cervix, the size of your uterus, your ovaries. Um, HPV vaccination, oh my gosh, I always say this, if it was 50 years ago and we said, holy cow, we have a shot that will prevent cancer, everyone would have said this is magic, like put me in line. Like Let's so it's, it. it's really astounding to me that we have to fight so hard to Why get people to want to do this. Why? I think there's a lot of stigma around HPV mm -hmm. um, and I do everything I can to just take that away from everyone. Mm -hmm. Holy cow, the numbers are greater than 80% of us have HPV. Yeah. Some of us clear it, some of us don't. I think the numbers are probably even a little bit higher. Mm -hmm. You don't know, like when you have an abnormal pap or cancer, you have no idea when you were exposed to HPV it was likely years and years and years before. So I think there's a stigma associated with it. We're not doing a great job in Kansas, unfortunately. We're always ranked 45th or below in our rates of HPV vaccination. Um, we're certainly doing a lot of things to try and increase those. We also know that now there's more data saying if you even get one of the three shots, that provides a protective benefit. So even if we can catch kids coming in, if we can even give them one shot, that is looking to help protect them. And I think there, that we have some stats from the from the yeah. CDC that's showing that uh, that more adolescents have been getting the HPV shot. Yeah. Uh, again, this is as of 2022, around 60% of U.S. teens have had the recommended doses, yeah. but you're saying we, we need to obviously get those numbers up and certainly here. Yeah. Yeah, I would, and I'll defer to Dr. Hawkinson, he'll know numbers probably a little bit better than me, but I mean, I think in Kansas, we're under 50% of even getting one shot in Kansas. So we're doing better as a country. We need to do better in Kansas and right. Missouri. Okay, we'll keep this conversation going. Be sure to ask your questions. You use the chat on YouTube or Facebook. You can tweet us or email Medical News Network. Info is right there on your screen. Uh, we want to get our COVID count from Dr. Dana Hawkinson, but I also want you to weigh in on what we've been talking about, Hawk, uh, just about the vaccine and kind of jump in on what Dr. Jula said. Yeah, no, I, I think, you know, she's exactly right. And we will continue to endorse and promote these vaccines. These vaccines, really all of them that are on the market are safe and efficacious. And this is a gift that parents can give to their children to help prevent cancers in the future. It is safe and effective. And, and she's exactly right, you know. Um, we have some numbers put together for us today. Um, so when she was talking about uh, under 50% of females, that is true, it's about 43% of females, unfortunately, are up to date with their vaccines. And it's even lower for males, 20 to 30%. So extremely low numbers on something that can be preventing so much morbidity and mortality when these children are old and I think um, we need to continue to, to promote these things and it is uh, we need to reduce the stigma we need to increase access there are a lot of it, it is multifactorial but we need to continue to, to get these vaccines in arms all right so this is our first time talking since the new year and yeah. let's let's just talk COVID numbers what yeah. are we seeing so right now 33 active six in the ICU this is unfortunate because I think last week um, when it was all said and done I think we had like low 20s and so we have gone up unfortunately um, so right now we are continuing to wait and see how it goes unfortunately the numbers again have popped up over 30 six in the ICU so there is uh, um, there is uh, an increase right now hopefully it will peak and plateau and maybe we can show some numbers later on in the week but just looking through previous respiratory viral seasons this season right now with the amount of people that are actually uh, going to emergency department or primary care for evaluation of flu-like illness and that would c include flu common cough and cold covid and rsv it's just a general term uh, we are seeing this starting to peak which would be similar to the 2018 2019 2019, 2020, and 2021, 22 seasons. So I think we are really getting a seasonality of COVID itself. And obviously you know that 2020 to 2021, there was hardly any respiratory viral illness. But hopefully we are starting to see this initial peak. Uh, we know school is going back. Kids will probably still get infected. Families will probably still get infected uh, in the next couple weeks. But hopefully that peak of people uh, having symptoms and illness is going to be coming within the next couple weeks and then we can see a downtrend. And Hawk, I wanna ask you about something because we know that when the pandemic started, we didn't have yeah. treatments for COVID like we do now, Paxlovid, of course, but some yeah. doctors were using unproven drugs like yeah. hydroxychloroquine. You saw a new study that estimated mm -hmm. how many deaths were actually mm -hmm. linked to hydro, hydro, 
Plop, bleh, you got it. Hydroxychloroquine. Okay. <laughs> I can only say it once a morning. Hydroxychloroquine. You know. hey, Thank you. That's a lot of syllables. That's, that's okay. That's why you make the big bucks. You get to say the big num the big words. Yeah. Um, but that number in that study was like nearly 17,000 uh -huh. deaths. Yeah. What, what do you make of the study? What does that even yeah, mean? Yeah, and that was a median range. So this was a, a, a good article. This is a meta-analysis. So actually they took six different countries and they looked at 44 different studies from those countries about people who had gotten hydroxychloroquine versus those that didn't. And um, they estimated that there were 17,000 uh, deaths because of getting uh, hydroxychloroquine. Now that was a range, that's the median area. Uh, the range was actually 6,200 to 19,000 deaths. Um, so again, they looked at six different countries. United States was one of them. And of course, wouldn't you know it, we had almost 12, uh, almost 13,000 deaths due to hydroxychloroquine. We were uh, the leader in that. Um, so these are estimates. There is imprecision there, and the, the, uh, the authors note that. And again, it is a meta-analysis, but we have to take each study on its own and then combine them. And basically what it does show is that there is, and this is what the authors say as well, they illustrate that there is hazard and there is risk of using drug repurposing uh, from one thing, because hydroxychloroquine is very good when you use it for what it's recommended for, and repurposing it for another thing, especially with low level evidence. And there was extreme low level, level, uh, low level evidence with this drug. And unfortunately, what we saw is that really, we saw an extra you know, 17,000 uh, 17, deaths around the world. So, and, they also, one of the things that they were looking at was prescription databases. So we know that especially a lot of people in the United States were maybe getting it from veterinary sources that weren't even in the prescription database as well. So it's unfortunate, um, more morbidity, more illness and lives that probably could have been saved if not using that drug. But I think this does, again, illustrate the risks of using drugs for one thing that are really meant for another, especially when there's low quality evidence that they have any benefits. All right, yeah, that makes sense. And thanks for showing off what you said like five or six times. Yeah. Hydroxychloroquine. Yeah. Hydroxychloroquine. I had to get that out. There you go, you got it. <laughs> I got that, you can, okay. You can do this. All right, Doc, thanks so much. Good to yeah. see you. Uh, yeah, 2024. I know. We're entering into it. Let's do this. Let's do <laughs> That's it. That's right. All right, let's get to some questions from our viewers today. And Hawk, just stay there real quick. Jason wants to know, if I have recently had COVID and I feel like I am fully recovered, are there any specific medical conditions that I am at an increased risk for which a medical screening would be recommended? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, really, we know that you're, you have an increased risk of certain events, like cardiac events. Um, we know that people with a history um, who had COVID at some point in time can be at higher risk of diabetes. There's not really any screening test that can be used. I think just talk with your primary care physician. Um, you know, obviously, if you're otherwise in good health, you want to stay in good health. And I would just do the normal routine exam, blood work, um, while in, in, on your yearly, uh, your, your yearly visit to your primary care physician. But there's nothing um, that is obvious that stands out to do new screening for just from recovery from COVID. All right, Hot, thanks so much. All right, so a question from Lisa, Dr. Jewell, are rates of cervical cancer declining? What do we know? You know, they initially declined for a bit and now they're kind of at a stalemate actually. So we're sort of hanging out um, where, where we've been. So that we haven't moved the needle a ton recently. How do we? Well, I vaccine. mean, the, yeah, the vaccine, and that's going to be something we'll see more down the line. But, you know, the vaccine was approved a while ago, and so that's where we initially saw a little bit of a dip, and now we're just sort of mm -hmm. hanging out. So increasing vaccination rates. Um, I think that some um, providers and patients with the new guidelines saying pap smears three to five years, I think that's a really hard time to remember. Has it been five years? Mm -hmm. When? And so I think that there have been some women that have been going longer um, because it's just a hard time. That's why I say just go see your doctor every year. Well, I, well I've been, you know, getting my pap for 30 years. And yeah. so the last time I got it and she said, great, see you in five years. I said, huh? Yeah. I yeah. mean, that was surprising yeah. to me. I said, well, what yeah. do you mean? Why? I've always have to have it every year. I've been, yeah. I've been like diligent about getting every year. And so what's yeah. happened? So yeah. I can see where that would, would throw people yeah, a bit. Yeah, exactly. It can but be if I want one, can mm -hmm. I ask for one? Well, that's where it gets a little bit tricky as far as will it be covered by yes, insurance. Yes. Um, and so I will tell you that if you are having symptoms that would necessitate mm -hmm. getting one, then I think, yes, it would be covered. If you're not, 
it would likely not be covered. Um, I have some patients that say, that's okay, I'll just pay out of pocket. I, I would want to get it yearly. I, I don't have pap smears declined a lot, though. What kind of symptoms might we be looking for? So the bleeding with intercourse mm -hmm. is a really common symptom. Irregular bleeding, pelvic pain or cramping, um, abnormal discharge. So women, and it may not be really terrible, but just be like, gosh, things are different down there. Um, but most women have no symptoms. Mm, that's scary. So it's that's why the coming in and getting the pap smears and the exams is so important. Screening is key. Mm -hmm. All right, let's get our takeaways today. Dr. Jewel, I'll stay with you. What do you want people to take away from this chat? Um, what, what I always say, get a pelvic exam every year. And if you have symptoms, I talk a lot about the abdominal symptoms, but like abdominal pain, bleeding, anything like that. If someone sees you, they prescribe something, they don't do a pelvic exam, you just keep moving down the line until you get to a doctor that does. Gotcha, good, good tip. All right, what is the takeaway, Brooke, from your story? Honestly, from the moment I was diagnosed after everything I, that we went through together, I said that I would be an advocate for cervical cancer. And basically, don't be embarrassed. You know, whenever she told me HPV, I was mortified. But after hearing the statistics, mm -hmm. it's, it's a lot more common than what everybody knows. So well, it is, and thank yeah. you for being brave enough to come yeah. forward and talk about something that, like you said, probably affects more than 80% of us. Yeah. Yes. So yeah. do the math, people, do the math. Thank you yeah. so much for being yeah. here with us today. We thank appreciate it. Having me. Just be well, okay? Thank you. Yeah. All right, thank you to all of our guests. Thanks to all of our viewers for being with us today. We're glad to be back, and we will be back Wednesday with an all-new episode of Open Mics with Dr. Stites. What happens when high blood pressure reaches inside your lungs? I'm Jessica Lovell on the next Open Mics with Dr. Stites, the changing treatments for pulmonary hypertension. Meet one young woman hoping new medicine will help reclaim her life Wednesday at 8. Subscribe to our morning medical update and open mics with Dr. Stites podcast. Now everywhere podcasts are available.